Hi everybody, welcome to the October 2019 Houston Co Coaching Meetup Group. My name is Gail Goddard, I'm a professional organizer. Say hi. 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 Clutter Ferry here. Um, our topic tonight is how much is enough and other hard questions about stuff. And this is a topic that we're revisiting because the first time that we tried it was early on in our tech world and you know our recording was horrible. And we have gotten a lot of complaints about the sound, and so we're um, revisiting this topic, and hopefully in a, a little more updated version. But um, so the sound will be better because we're recording it in a better, better camera. Okay, so the original story is about us, my friends and I, going to Galveston for Fourth of July weekend. And we went down to spend the weekend, and so Ed was our cook in charge. And he remarked as we were down there, after we were down there for a little bit, that he had packed more for that trip, for the three days that we spent in Galveston, than he did for his three-week trip to Italy. And at the time, we all laughed about it, that was really funny. But he said he had too many clothes, he had taken too many clothes and shoes, and of course he is also, he was in charge of the meals. And so he had packed up a whole bunch of the kitchen to take with to come and part of it was because at the time he said part of it was because he had we were in the car like you can't take as much on an airplane as you can't take in a car right so we overpack because there's a car which is another discussion about space and then he got down there and what he said to us as we started talking about it was he was trying to keep his options open he was trying to have several choices to make about what he was going to cook. He didn't want to you know, choose in advance. And so he came prepared to make three different meals for one dinner. <laughs> and so he had packed all that stuff. And then when it was time to go home, he was grumbling about putting all of it back in the car because he had to take a whole bunch of it back home again. And so he did have really great options for us. And it begs the question, how much is enough? We got a dinner that was absolutely fabulous because whenever he cooks, the food is fabulous. Let me just say from experience. <laughs> and he didn't tell us what we missed, right? We had the meal that he prepared and it was great. And we had a great time with our friends and we enjoyed ourselves and it was fabulous. And all of the options that he didn't prepare, we didn't know anything about. So we weren't suffering disappointment for like, why did you cook this one? Cause number option number three would have been so much better. Like we didn't know the difference. Right. And so what we had was fabulous. And so it was an excess of choices. And I'm guessing partially because it's hard to make those decisions. Like that was his version of, I can't decide. Therefore I'm just going to bring it all right. I can't decide. So it's all, and it'll fit in the car. <laughs> I can't decide and it'll fit in the car so it's all going and I'll make the decision later. And what that meant was that we all had a great meal but he had to bring too much and take home too much at the end. So it was more of a hassle for him to manage all the stuff. So what's the point of this story? Somehow we've gotten it into our heads that the more that we have, the more fun we can have or the happier that we'll be. And if we have more and better things in our space or our car or our luggage, don't give me the luggage thing we'll have better experiences. The idea being that we have to have a huge amount of stuff in order to have fun. And our lives are so more complicated because we choose to make them that way. So I have this quote that I found that was from a school teacher from the 1870s and her name is Anna C. Brackett. And this is the one that I want to read so I make sure I quote her correctly. We go on multiplying our conveniences only to multiply our cares. Yes, we can relate. We increase our possessions only to the enlargement of our anxieties. So this is the 1870 version of the more I have, the more stressed out I am, right? She's saying that about 1870. <laughs> and how much more possession obsessed are we now in this day and age? And how much more stressed out are we? Like she thought she was stressed out. Girl, you have no idea, right? The more stuff that we have, the more stressed that we are. So I've been beating for almost 30 years now. That's quite shocking. And any crafty chick will tell you that if you are into whatever the craft is, you got to have it. you got to have more of it. You are never through shopping. There's always another bead, and I totally get it, right? Like, oh my gosh, I have enough to open a store in my house 100%. Like, I own it. It's a whole room, right? I have a whole room that is just beads, right? So... 
luckily beads are small <laughs> it's not like a quilt room right like people that do fabric and other crafts that require bigger supplies like I it's hard for them so beads are small but I have been collecting and I am a guilty crafter just like anyone else and the more it doesn't matter that I have plenty there's always another bead to buy there's always more to add to the collection <coughs> But the flip side of having the ability to make any kind of beaded thing that I want ever, like if all bead stores died today, I would be able to keep myself crafting until I dropped dead. Like, I would never run out. <laughs> and none of my friends would run out, and we would all have plenty to keep ourselves busy. And we're all laughing about now that we need craft executors because all of my friends are afraid that if they die before their husbands, their husbands are going to take all of the craft and throw it on the curb. And they have no idea how many tens of thousands of dollars of beads are going out of the curb. And so we're all like, okay, you're in charge of racing over to my house if I die so that Carlos doesn't throw my stuff out. It's absolutely a huge, huge supply is what I'm saying. I can do anything that I want to from my own, my existing stash and so can my friends. But the flip side of being able to do that is that I don't have any challenge to my creativity. There's something to be said for you work with less supplies and you are having to work harder and be more innovative with the less supplies that you have to make something happen and end up with something that you like on the other end. And so I think we acquire, acquire, acquire to make more and more and more options. But a lot of my friends are also super overwhelmed with that many options. Like the more choices that you have to make, the more frozen you get about it. I remember a time when I was younger and I had no money. We all, in college, we have no money, right? Like you don't have anything. And uh, you're gonna go out with your friends, right? And so you go in the closet and you put on your best outfit, whatever you got, you put on the swagger, you put on the attitude, and you go out and you have a good time. I didn't have anything. <laughs> I was walking to school. I was walking to college back and forth from my apartment. My dad was paying for my apartment. I had a crappy job on campus at the college. And this was how I existed and went and had fun with my friends. Did this slow me down? Not at all. I was still able to have a great time. The fact that I didn't have 47 new outfits all the time to wear, it didn't matter. It didn't impede me. And I, now I'm this much farther down my life path and I have a closet full of stuff and you know that you go and stand in the closet and go, I have nothing to wear. And you're looking at 200 pieces of clothing, right? <laughs> the more options that you have sometimes, it makes it that much harder to choose. The equivalent I have is, think about little kids. This is true about little kids and moms will know this for sure. If you say to a little kid, what do you want for dinner? Which implies, of the infinite possibilities in the universe, what do you want to eat? And you can just see their little brain just shuts down. It just freezes in place. Like they cannot cope with that decision. How about, or they'll say something like banana splits. <laughs> right, exactly. If you say, do you want a hamburger or a hot dog? Then there's two things and they can make a choice. They can say A or B and they can process that, right? That's the little brain version of this idea. As adults, there is still neuroscience about too many options shut your brain down. So I've read a whole bunch, this shows up in the marketing world as well. I've read uh, research where they put a bunch of products in, in front of clients, like they have a smaller quantity of products for this group, and this group gets a whole bunch of products. This group with the smaller choices, they buy more because they're not overwhelmed. And this group that has so many choices, they get overwhelmed and they walk away without buying anything. And so there is something about your brain can only handle so much stuff at once before it completely shuts down. In that environment, if you translate that to your house and you think about my closet just gets more and more and more clothes stuffed into it, my junk room gets fuller and fuller and fuller. My garage ends up with more and more and more. And eventually it's like a sea, it's a mountain of stuff, right? That you cannot possibly know what's in there, find what's in there, remember how to use it all. Think about it when there's an intersection time between I need this object A 
and five years ago, object A went into the back of the garage in the corner and it's got five years worth of stuff in front of it. So there's no way you can go get it without deconstructing the entire garage, which means you gotta go shopping, right? Because now you need it. I think that we are coached by American consumerism that we need to keep adding. We're coached by our, my crafty friends. We goad each other into buying more. We'll be shopping together and, oh, look, Gail, this is your color. You need to have this. Oh, look, this is you. Yes, you should buy that. The fact that it's too much money or you don't have enough credit, whatever, you should buy it anyway. Like, we talk each other into it all the time. We're 100% guilty. We always receive constant pressure to add, 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 add. And we spend all of our money, and then the, our money has turned into stuff, and then the stuff is filling up the house, and you can't find it, and you can't use it, and it's too much. It is, it is a recipe for shutting down and not being able to handle anything anymore. We do this in our own lives. We, really, we work really hard to add more and more choices, right? So here's a more modern quote. This guy's name is Graham Hill, and he was the founder of Tree Hugger. Mm -hmm. so, he, it, so he was a wealthy, and he traded in his million-dollar mansion for a 420-square-foot 420, 420 apartment in New York City. Of course, it's in New York City. But he has, in his kitchen, in his 420 square feet, 12 salad bowls and some utensils. And that's his kitchen. <laughs> I guess. Now... Presumably part of the reason this works for him is because he can go to the bottom of the building or down the street and get food and come back and eat it, right? I don't know if he's actually cooking, but they showed a picture in this article where I found this quote, and here's his 12 salad bowls stacked up. He eats everything out of those bowls. He doesn't put anything in. It's just those bowls and the utensils. That's all he has in his kitchen. And he has quoted in saying about his new space, I like material things as much as anyone. I studied product design in school. I'm into gadgets, clothing, and all kinds of things. But my experiences have shown that after a certain point, material objects have a tendency to crowd out the emotional needs they're meant to support. And he's right. We live in spaces that overwhelm us. We're drowning in possessions because we have the resources or the credit to handle it. And it re results in more anxiety, more depression, more unhappiness because at a certain point, you can't manage it anymore. At a certain point, in order to keep up with the whole house full of stuff, you're spending all your time putting things away, cleaning things off. You want some in the back of the closet, so you gotta move a bunch of things out of the closet to get the thing you want, and then you gotta put it all back again. And it's, it's a constant game of Tetris in your house to find and use the things that you want. And so we spend a bunch of our time managing stuff instead of interacting with people on an emotional level, instead of tending to our emotional needs, instead of being in service to our own happiness, I guess is the way that I want to put it. It's a, it's a process of blending all of our emotions out and burying them in the stuff and trying to manage it. And when I go and work in people's houses, they're paying me to move their stuff around. But then when we do it, Suddenly there's mental space and emotional space free for them. I was just today in somebody's house and she has this big sort of triangular shaped kitchen and there's a big island, like a big island with the sink in the middle, you know, and, it's, and it goes around and there's like bar stools on the backside. So it's this big hunk of real estate in the middle of the floor, right? And all of the counters, all of the prep counters along the sides of the stove, by the fridge, and then this whole island was covered in stuff. And so there was, I was there for four hours today, four. So two people, that's eight man hours. And we uncovered all the counters. <laughs> that's all we did. We didn't get into the cabinets. Uh, we worked in the drawer, we pulled some drawers out and we worked some of the skinny drawers, but we didn't get all the way into the cabinets at all. So eight man hours just to uncover the surfaces in the kitchen again for her to work. So A, she spent a bunch of money for me to help her. B, she spent four hours of her own time and my time to uncover it. And the end result was for her to go, oh my gosh, I feel so much better. Because there wasn't a bunch of stuff in there making her insane. Like she still wanted a lot of the stuff, 
but I also went out with a carload of stuff that was not necessary for her to keep anymore. And so we removed some of the options. We removed some of the choices. We made the choices lay out better in the house, in the kitchen, put things away. Here's the coffee section. Here's the tea section. Here's the, you know, we relayed out. Here's the dog section. And the end result was when I left the house, she said, I feel so much better. It's so much calmer in here. It's, I know the rest of the house is a wreck, but this is really relieving to me to see this real estate. And the bread maker was still out and the juicer was still out and the air fryer was still out and the candles was still out. There was the tea, the coffee pot. You know, we didn't make it all disappear, but we dialed it back to the stuff that she actually wanted to use. And if she wasn't using it and she told me she wasn't using it or she only used it once a month or whatever, then we went and put it away somewhere so that it wasn't in her face. And some of those things went into my bag to go to donation. And so I spent four hours and she spent four hours and we created emotional calm. Yes, ma'am. Quick question on donations. Uh, I know I've got, if I'm recently decluttering my own place, I know that when you got a whole truckload of things, it's not hard to take them to Goodwill or the paper shredder. But when, when you're trying to keep more things from filling the gaps, when you're in, get rid of one old one for every new one you bring home, it's not always, doesn't always feel so natural to take just one little coffee mug to the Goodwill. Well, right, but you know, what I tell people to do is put a box in a corner, not a big box, because you gotta be able to lift it later, right? <laughs> you can't overfill it. But if you get a cute container that you can set things that you wanna donate, I do this in my closet, so that when I find clothes that I'm like, oh, I try that on, oh, that looks awful. I'm never putting it on again, fold, 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 boom. So I have a little bin, it's about this tall, and it's just plastic, little square. And it sits in the bottom of my closet and I throw one thing at a time. Then when it's full, you have enough for a grocery bag, you know, like a paper grocery bag probably. You can fill that up and then you can take that back to Goodwill. So you just need a little collection site, an in-house collection site, so that you can add one, one little coffee mug at a time until you get to some place that you feel like it's worth the trip. Because it would be <coughs> annoying to make one dry for one cup, totally. But you can certainly collect over time. And then you realize that you're, if you do that, you're being active about evaluating your stuff all the time, right? You're pulling that down and like, yeah, that's the, that's the like one of the things we found was here's the grinder. She had a, a you know, a little coffee grinder thing with the, we press on it, zzz, right? And it was not working and she'd never thrown it out. It's like, doesn't work. But it had gotten lost on the sea. It was on the counter, and she picked it up and said, this doesn't work. And she's like, yeah, trash. That's, there you go. Out it goes. So as you touch things and you realize you're not going to keep it, if you have a collection site, you can go add it in and make it disappear. Okay? Cool. Thank you. Okay. So I am going back to Mr. Hill. Like Mr. Hill says, after a certain point, the excess of stuff crowds out instead of supports our emotional needs. And that's the thing to realize, that at some point, you're spending all your time focusing on something material, and you've given up something emotional, spiritual, intellectual, like all the thoughts are going to the managing of the stuff instead of the interactions with people, instead of interacting with your family, instead of you know, enriching yourself in some way with your craft or your fun. If you can allow yourself to let go and dial it back to a level that feels manageable again, then you sort of get some level of calm and peace about it. And it gives you back some of your mental space. And I hear this from clients all the time, that once we clear out something, then they feel calmer, they feel peaceful, they feel like, ooh, they're not distracted anymore. And if you bring to the table, I am ADD, I am OCD, then the more stuff that you have, the harder it is going to be challenging to your um, illnesses, to your triggers, it's gonna set stuff off. And so it's super important if you are fighting against something in your own mind already, that you do what you can to support yourself against that process. Okay, so I am going to ask if you have any questions about this process or other organizing things. 
Well, yes, ma'am. I can say something about too many options. I'm an idea, uh, the idea is an experience collector. I even have a personality test result to confirm that. <laughs> right? And I have a list of things I want, books I want to read, old TV shows I want to rewatch, uh, restaurants I want to eat at, and I'm struggling to come to terms with the fact that, especially since most of them keep growing, I probably won't hit zero in five years, <laughs> ten years, or a lifetime. Right? However, in the way I prevent indecision paralysis, I alphabetize the number of the list, and then I turn on the random number option on my computer. Oh, I love it! That's <laughs> awesome! And the truth is, you don't have to get to zero, like you don't have to end up at zero and you're, as you're dead, right? Like, why not die with a list of great ideas that you haven't gotten to yet? It just means that you've been active and your mind has been going and you keep thinking up fun things to do, which means you're having a lot of fun, right? I love that idea. There's no reason why that list has to be zero. Other than, you know, we all, uh, as, a, as a former accountant, coming to zero was always really important when it all balanced out to zero. But, yeah. That whole, um, somebody's got to come and clear out my bead room at the end. There's going to be some point where I'm going to have to, like, cut down the, you know, in my old age, I'm going to have to shrink down the population and give away a whole bunch of it. And then I'll die with a little corner of beads <laughs> somewhere, and somebody's going to have to clear that out. It'll just be a bonus for whoever gets to get my stuff. They'll just have, you know, a craft store. <laughs> it's already happened. I've had some friends pass away, and, you know, then we have this whole, like, we have to take the whole collection and bring it in offer it to the wider audience and let it be collected and absorbed into somebody else's stuff. And so, someday all your stuff is going to be somebody else's. Well, it's cut my mom. My mom was a seamstress. And right? So she had tons of fabric. She had fabric and notions and the and the thread spools that were wooden. Mm -hmm, Those are mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Buttons. Tens. Ten thousand buttons. gazillion buttons. And tens. Yes, of course. And then... I don't know, she was somewhere walking and somebody picked her up and took her home and then that person like gave her a bunch of stuff that was her mother's stuff. Oh. <laughs> and when my mother lived, she was like known as the person who could alter and mend things. So they kept giving her things. It's like, oh no. But anyway, um, I inherited a few things. <laughs> uh, you inherited a sewing room is what you're saying. A well-stocked sewing room. Unfortunately, I have four sewing machines and I don't use any of them. Uh. <laughs> <laughs> there was her fob, which is like, you know. Yeah, it's super expensive. And it's like, still works. And so, you know, it's like, it's hard to get rid of her things. Mm -hmm. Though I keep looking at them, probably some of it's rotting, literally. And... Yeah, because fabric and, you know, glass beads don't deteriorate in place, but fabric does. Fabric will. And thread. Get into it. Or yeah. Not, you yeah, know? Yeah, 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 yeah. And so it's like, oh my gosh, what do I do? <laughs> and as a hoarder as I am, a sentimental person, it's just hard. Right? Mm -hmm. So this is, um, this is every, everybody's problem with dealing with their parents' stuff, right? You, your sister just went through this. They just moved Ed's parents out of the house into a new assisted living place, and so it was time to downsize the parents' stuff. And Beth was in there throwing, throwing, throwing. She was slinging it and running, right? And it was hard for your dad. I mean, Ann told me some stories about it. It was really hard for him to let go of the stuff, but it's like, you still can't take it with you. We have not worked that out. And, and I lost 50 pounds, and so I had been going through my closet purging, and I thought, and then somebody said, oh, there was somebody that was a, a victim of, like, a abuse. Like, she was kicked out of her own home by her significant other, and she, like, needed clothes. I thought, oh, I got Here's some clothes. clothes. <laughs> I took trash bags over. And I said, because I don't want to go back to that weight. Right, you know right, right. It's hard to adjust to that. And it, and it is a process to deal with. The excess stuff that's yours is different than the excess stuff that you inherit, right? Because it comes with all the memories and it was my mom's or it was my dad's and it's, it's a whole different ball of wax when you inherit. But the, for the things particularly that you inherit, they're already old when they come to you most of the time, right? 
And so if you hang on to them for another 20 years and nobody's using them and they've deteriorated another 20 years, like there's definitely not going to get any use out of them. And so part of it is recognizing that you can still honor your parents and you can still hold on to the things that you think are a good representative sample of your mom without keeping 100% of what came to you. And usually what happens is um, when somebody dies, it's super stressful. It's the worst time of your life. And you can't make any decisions in that moment. Like you lose the ability to make decisions because you're so stressed. Grief is terrible and it shuts you down. But two years later, three years later, you're, uh, you've integrated it a little bit better and then you can go back and make some decisions. And so part of it is pulling the cream of the crop and letting the rest go and have somebody be using it. I remember another thing, I had some emotional difficulty in rid of stuffed animals, all these old teddy bears that bring back memories. Most of them were in good condition, but dusty from just sitting on yeah, the Yeah, from just waiting, day. right? We all are really, like my niece had 400 and gazillion stuffed animals on top of her bed. You know, when you're little, like everybody brings you another stuffed animal. Every relative that you know, every event that happens, you get another stuffed animal. And then you end up with this collection that you are slightly anthropomorphizing about. And it's like, oh, I love these babies. And then what do you do? Yeah. yeah. I know it's some, a struggle. I know some nonprofits who collect uh, new and gently used stuffed animals for, to give the kids who have been through traumatic situations. That's awesome. That's great. And there's got to be some of that everywhere, right? Like there's got to be some kind of service like that in every big city in the country. So go hunting. <laughs> there's got to be somebody that wants those animals and that can dust them, wash them, clean them, and have them safely redistributed to somebody that needs them. The truth is we have things come into our life and we use them for a while, right? And then at some point they stop being useful to us and they still have use but you're never gonna go back to it. You've moved on to the next thing and you're never gonna go back and use up the use. You might as well give it to someone else, move it on and let somebody else get use out of it before it dies. Which is why I'm saying to you, the stuff that came from your mom's house is already aged and now it's aging more with you and nobody's getting any use out of it. And so deciding as you look at her collection this four sewing machines and like pick the best two and send two off somewhere you know there's probably a home ec department somewhere that would love to have those machines it's a process to make decisions and it's hard and sometimes you have to start with the stuff that like I'm guessing that you're more sentimental about her sewing because that's was so much of who she was right like that was a big part of her personality and how she was in the world was that I am an expert sewer and this is my thing so that collection is going to be harder for you than say the clothes that she wore or the toiletries that were in her bathroom or that kind of stuff yeah because I won't get rid of that sewing machine as long as it works I'm using it that's okay use it. if you use it right I learned how to sew on that machine because you had a lot right <laughs> so that I think that one is then the one that has the biggest emotional bang for the buck right like that one is got is really juicy sentimental for you and that's a good one to keep and that means that some of the other machines that you don't have that emotional attachment to would be the ones that you would want to let go of right yeah. And there's, you know, you could put that one on Facebook to your friends and say, okay, I'm giving up one of my mother's machines. Who wants it? And somebody will want it. That's what you do with the stuff that's big and super important and difficult. But when you're talking about a whole house full of stuff that's come in, you really, you can't make piecemeal them all out one at a time. Like it'll take way too much time. So you really want to look for bulk solutions about the things that aren't super distressing to you. Yes, ma'am. Somewhere I read or heard a rumor that um, resale shops are overrun with tchotchkes. <laughs> <laughs> tchotchkes, uh, decorative items. It's, yeah, yeah, you know, yeah. They're just overrun. They don't need more. Do you hear people zero-based budgeting to declutter? Theory, you know, that theory? Or is that weird? It's not weird. It's a useful idea. And I'm trying to think that, um, you know, I guess if somebody is... It's sort of a version of Marie Kondoing, right? Like, you take everything out and you sort through and make choices about all of it. So she tends to attack rooms. Her process is pull it all out, fish, 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 
donate, 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 and you put back what you're going to keep. And how that is, um, it works, and it's a lot of work. Like you're, you're tackling, if you think of a really stuffed, huge walk-in closet, that's hours and hours and hours of work to pull all that out, go through it all, make decisions, try things on, all that, you know. And so it may not be something that you want to tackle in one sitting, right? <laughs> like you don't want to try to do it all at once. But yeah. you could do a rod at a time or a drawer at a time or, you know, you could do a smaller piece where you pull everything out and go looking for what you want and put that stuff back and the rest goes away. Yes, yeah. my uncle... He left behind when he died several, uh, about a bookshelf full of handwritten journals. According to the relatives who bothered to read them, they are awful dull. They, <laughs> they, you know, it should be emotional, laden instant to read like sales reports. Uh, but uh, no one really wants to throw, throw them away because they're afraid of being disrespectful. And obviously they aren't going to interest anyone outside the family. Right. So any suggestions? So that is another one where there's a lifetime's worth of journals, but you can pull, like I was talking about her sewing machine, you can pull a representative sample. So A, they're boring, B, nobody wants to be disrespectful, but you can keep five journals or 10 journals, you know, one from each decade or two from every five years or whatever, and let this as a sample, as a representative sample, and then let the rest be recycled, be burned, however the family feels comfortable, like if they don't want his stuff out there, then they can, you know, destroy it so that it feels safe to them. Oh. I just had more of a comment to tell you the truth about the whole choice, mm -hmm. you know, too many choices. Right. In our home, it comes in the form of mm -hmm. oils, vinegars, and spices <laughs> that we collect. <laughs> but what I've realized often is that it's an illusion because I think they're all available to me but I've forgotten that they have expiration dates. So when I go in there and do my keep toss method, it's like, no, I really have less options than what I thought. I still have too many, but you know, not as many as I thought. Well, and when you have that many, then some of them die before you can use them, right? Like that's the thing about food stuff, so the oil and stuff starts to go bad and if you open it, but even if you don't open it, eventually it's gonna like turn nasty, right? Well, so since, since we're the cooks out of out of our group of friends, we've inherited a lot of spices when people <laughs> move, you know right? move away. Same kind of thing, right? I just looked in my spice cabinet the other day. I was making something and I didn't have baking powder. I was looking for my alternative. But anyway, I looked at oh, that's two years old. But in the meantime, I was looking at some other things. Stuff in there that was nine years old. <laughs> it's like, oh my gosh. Yeah. People laugh it's about spices good. and they always like, yeah, yeah, it's just, it, but it'll be fine. Okay. Well, sure, it'll be fine. But what's happening is that it's losing its strength, it's losing its potency. So, yeah, it'll still be garlic salt, but will it still <laughs> taste like garlic when you put it in? Like, I don't know. Right? Like some of that stuff, it, it's, it's going to slowly fade over time because it's a natural product, right? Somebody oh. grew that stuff. And so it's oh. not always, it doesn't retain its potency. But things like aspirin and Bepto-Bismol, uh, I mean, aren't there any they sell in sizes you might, can actually use up when you only need them <laughs> a couple times a quarter? I know, right? I, I agree with you because... Unless you're somebody that's taking that stuff all the time, it's hard to get through. And we also, this is where we, we succumb to the marketing, right? They try to convince us that the bigger bottle is a better deal. And I want you to just think, Gail says no. <laughs> because you may buy 400 Advil, but you're going to throw away half of them because you're not going to, you're going to get a quarter of the way through the bottle before they start to be old. And then you're going to take them you know, two years past expiration date and you'll still only be halfway through the bottle and at some point you're going to have to give up, right? So, But you see, I, I do that because I think a year after the expiration date, I think I heard something they're still good. Well, and you know, we can get a whole discussion about how everybody has their own tolerance level for how far past they will um, you know, deal with the expiration dates, how far they will keep eating or take taking drugs. And I keep looking at you know, the stuff that comes from the drugstore to me is like, it's a bottle full of chemicals. I have no idea what those chemicals are. I have no idea what's happening to them over time. I'm not the scientist in the room. 
okay, so I might wait for a year, but at some point I'm sort of like, mm, now I'm just playing Russian roulette because I don't know nothing about what's happening in that bottle. <laughs> but everybody has their own threshold is my point. And you can still buy the smaller bottle and have, it's a better deal in the long run. A, you're only having to store a much smaller container. B, you might actually get to the bottom and have to go to the store and buy some more before the whole bottle expires and you have to throw it out, whatever that threshold is. Yes, ma'am. I feel overwhelmed when I think decluttering because we'll be moving in probably six months. Ooh. From one home to another. Okay. Which is like the In the city? Yes. Okay. One place to another, which okay. is like the ultimate opportunity to Declutter. Purge. Absolutely. And so, and I've known this for a while, and you would think I would have moved along the path by now, but no. And so sometimes when I hear this, your idea, you know, how much is enough, is, it really is appropriate for me at this time. I almost feel like it's hopeless and I don't know where to start, number one. But number two, while we've been talking, do you ever hear of anybody who has this idea of, like, I, I don't know, I, I hope this language is correct, but there's a full curve, like you just, you just make a little shift and then things move a lot. So I was brainstorming, does this ever work for anybody? Here's an idea. What if I set up like an accountability partner, you know, and I picked a room, you know, surely I could get a room in a month, you know, yeah. and a buddy, you know, does that, do you ever hear that working? Absolutely. I'm just brainstorming. Sure. I, I feel hope, I, mean, uh, I haven't accomplish anything yet. Let's put it that right. way. Right. <laughs> and I, and I, get that really you, I get that you feel overwhelmed and the idea of contemplating the whole house yeah. is turning your brain off. Right. So you need to keep shrinking your target until your brain stops turning off. So maybe you start with a drawer or you start with a tabletop or you start with one cabinet in the kitchen that nobody's opened for five years or you go into a closet that's full of stuff that is, you know, the junk room. You want to aim, start with things that are easy mm -hmm. and that you're not having to use in your regular life currently, right? Because that's the population that is the most ripe for letting go at this well, point. My emotional attachments. I have some areas that are like, like sentimental and this and that. Right. And well, you may run into that. But keep in mind that everything that you move, you're going to have to pay mm -hmm. for the box, for the mover, and you're gonna to have to pack it and unpack it. And a lot of times people run out of time and then they pack everything. They're like, oh, I'll just pack it all and deal with it on the other end. Okay, so now you're, you paid to pack it, to transport it, to unpack it, only to take it to Goodwill. How many people in your home are moving with you? We just have two people in my family. Okay. And we right. have two and a half dogs and a cat. Okay. Two and a half dogs? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> the only reason I was asking is because we're moving in four months and yeah. my starting point was his stuff. <laughs> he let you do that? Well, he was, so he, he, he has a big book collection and so I said, are we taking these? And he said, yes. Awesome. Is, I didn't have to make the decision. Oh, right. He did. Okay. So that's the only piece of it, I, you know. So are you going to pack it all yourself, or are you going to pay packers? That's question number one. I have no idea. How about your pet supplies? Do you need to declutter any of those? Oh, sure. Probably. Oh, yeah. yeah. Like, they have an abundance of stuff. Yeah. At least they, they, won't, they won't mind. <laughs> <laughs> they won't know the difference. Well, so what if well, you were going to pack it yourself? Where would you start? Well, well now. I, I would start now. We'll say oh, is... So the, the particular shelf that I pointed out, the, they were, they were, the books are only about this big. And so it was easy for me to like, you know, whenever I got something that I ordered online from eBay, it was easy for me to say, oh, this is a great box for these books. Mm. So that's actually technically where I started is just collecting book boxes. And I just so happened to get enough this week so I can put the last of them in you there. You pack the last of them. Mm -hmm. If you pack yourself, you really want to get started so that you're not at the end making yourself exhausted trying to pack everything. If you're going to let other people pack, then you can spend your time now thinning. And your only goal, if, if somebody else is, if you're going to pay movers to come in the last two days and pack everything that's left, mm -hmm. then you can spend your time going, yes, I want to move, no, I don't want to move. Yes, I want to move, no, I don't want to move. And then you're only taking the things 
out and going to goodwill with things that you don't want to move at the other end. So do you ever recommend like the one 800 got junk? So um, they're great, but they're going to, then you're just throwing it all away. I mean, basically they they're going to recycle it. I'm just no, the 800 got junk. They have their own process, but it doesn't involve a whole lot of recycling. It's not, that's not the, that's not part of their business model, as I recall. So you're basically p paying for it to disappear from you, which is fine, but uh, it's an expensive thing. Like it's not cheap to, for them to fill up a truck with your stuff. And I've had clients who we emptied a part of their garage into and filled up a truck. So you, if, depending on how much stuff you're trying to get rid of, you could be buying truck after truck after truckload of stuff that needs to go away. Better for you to filter and, and make it your job now to send things on that don't need to stay. And truthfully, if there's a whole bunch of stuff that's, you should try to get rid of the stuff that you're not sentimental about, yeah, right? Well, don't get hung up on the things that are a problem. <coughs> you can reduce volume for the things that you're not attached to, for the things that you don't have a lot of emotional um, reaction to. There are some things in there that you don't really care about and you won't have problems letting go of it and carrying it off. Focus on that. If that gets you moving and gets you thinking about it, gets you in that mindset and gets the ball rolling, everything that you take away is one less thing that somebody has to pack, whether it's you or the packers, right? And it's one less thing that you have to unpack, regardless of who packs, you're unpacking on the other end. <laughs> so everything that goes out is one less thing that you have to unpack when you're exhausted at the end of the move. So I would concentrate on the stuff that you can easily thin up front. Well, you kind of inspired me with a box idea, a version of your box idea, which is if I feel sentimental about something, I wrote down on my phone, put a box somewhere for the things you feel sentimental about you can't figure out, you know, rather than get stuck. Go, yeah, don't get stuck throw there. Throw it all in the box and then figure it out later. Maybe. Yeah, call it a sentimental box. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. I mean, if you can isolate it as it's, the only reason you're keeping it is because it's a keepsake, mm -hmm. then yeah. Make a pile of keepsakes and move on. Keep going with other stuff. Yes, ma'am. What are the rules for resale shops? What they'll tell you and they won't tell you? They're all different. They're all 100% different, yes. They all have their own experts. They all have their own days. They all have their own categories. They don't all sell the same stuff. They, it depends on who. So they do all have now in the age of tech, right? They all have their own websites. And so the, usually the rules are very spelled out. Like in Houston, Bluebird Circle takes big pieces of furniture. Nobody else does. Oh. You know that there's, there, you know, they sell a whole bunch of really large stuff, and and the place that's in Montrose, uh, it's not the Bluebird, it's the other one. Oh. With the, wow. yes, thank you, the Guild Shop. Um, the Guild Shop doesn't carry big. They don't have the space, so they don't carry large stuff. Um, they only carry artwork that's less than three feet. And the truth is, they have certain people that work on certain days. To evaluate whether they'll take the stuff or not like everybody has their own rules so if you decide I want to take stuff to the guild shop you got to open an account you got to look on the website you got to show up with clothes on this day and tchotchkes on this day and you know there's rules about when to drop off what and how many you can only take six you can only take two purses you can only take like there's all kinds of rules so you just have to look it up like same thing they have rules about how many and what kind and when if you're, tra you're oh, talking what? about you're talking about consignment resale. You're not talking yeah, about I guess just so. okay. Yeah. Even so, all they all have different rules. So it just depends but, on the you have to go to that shop and ask and you know find out what and when you can take. The point is everybody has different rules and the rules change. Oh yeah. When Harvey happened and everybody like everybody got flooded out and they everybody was forcibly decluttered by Harvey. <laughs> And then a whole bunch of stuff went to all, of, everybody was drowning. All the donation sites were drowning because everybody was emptying their house out because the house was being torn apart, right? And so there's lots of uh, locations that have, they're still trying to recover from the load that came at Harvey. So those rules change all the time. You gotta keep up with them. So you just gotta pick the store you wanna interact with and then follow their rule. Consignment is not cute and easy and no issue. It's not, Yes, you can make money in it, but they have a million other people trying to offload their stuff and you have to do some work to get money out of it. You don't get to just barf it at them and wait for money to flow your way. <laughs> That's the well, truth. And really, unless you, unless you have something that is a, 
a big name designer that cost a fortune up front, you're, you're not going to make enough off consignment to be worth your trouble. To be worth all the effort you have to part, do. For the most part, if you have stuff that's in good condition and wearable, you should donate it. Right? And, and the thing is, if you have an, something nice and you spend $5 on the dry cleaner and then you get $3 on the consignment, you're losing money. And some of them have rules, like if it's here for three months, then they donate it. Right? The guild shop, it stays in their shop for three months and then it goes away. So they, that's how they keep the inventory fresh, is that they churn it out. If it doesn't sell in three months, it's gone. And if you want it back, you have to buy it back. What? If you want it back, after you put it in, if you want it back, you have to pay oh. to get it back. Oh, wow. A percentage, it's like 10% or something. I forget exactly what the rule is. But if you want it back out of their you know, donation chain, you gotta take it back yeah, for you, money. Because you put it there and you're, they offered you a service by trying to sell even though it's Yeah, sell they have the store, they have the expenses for the store. Absolutely. And, my, and Penny did this, she had some her mother had collected um, metal purses from the 30s. And she had a, like it was her thing, and so she had 10 or 15 of them. She took them all, and a whole bunch of them sold, but there were some that didn't. And so she went back and bought back one of them, just so she would have one. And then some of them went off to be, you know, donated. So consignment shops, follow the rules. <laughs> and make it be worth it. Like if it's not worth your time, you're not going to get rich off of off clothes. All right, I'm going to stop because it's 8:15. Thank you so much. I appreciate you coming. See you next time. Bye.